I'm not going to give sort of a typical introduction. I'm just going to say today is going to be kind of technical for clarity's sake. I want to be really clear about what the Bible's teaching on this issue. And um, I also want to say to singles today, you're thinking, oh, this is for the married folks or folks who have been divorced or remarried. And I would say today you could probably learn more about marriage in any other context that you might get into when this subject comes up, because we got to talk about marriage. And so uh, learn a lot about marriage today. So hold tight and hang with us through it all. Uh, this week I was meeting with uh, Stu Jackson. We were having lunch together and we were talking about the sermon and um, he was like, man, you just preached on hell two weeks ago and now you're preaching on divorce uh, this Sunday, and um, we were talking about the sermon on hell and how difficult it was to preach the sermon on hell. And then we were talking about um, the sermon on divorce and and remarriage and how hard that is going to, to be to preach and uh, concerning the sermon on divorce and remarriage in light of the sermon on hell. Stu said to me, well, that's going to be harder than hell. So that's one way to put it, Stu. And so uh, maybe that relieves some of the tension that's in the room. But I am going to attempt to articulate what what the Bible teaches about this issue. And it's true. The Bible clearly addresses the issue of marriage, uh, divorce, and remarriage. It, God is clear on these issues, but the way every single issue of marriage, divorce, and remarriage works itself out is always not so clear. And so it's really difficult to apply what the Bible teaches to all of these issues. And so we want to come to this issue with humility. And I think the point of this passage is to stay close to God's heart on the issue. And anytime we move away from God's heart, that's where things get confusing. And we want to stay close to God's heart on the issue of marriage. And so just sort of some rules of engagement today. I need you all to stay to the end, like stay to the end. OK, we got to get to Jesus together and that's where we're headed. I also want to say this focus on the now focus on where you are right now and today. A lot of times when this issue comes up, we tend to fixate on things we cannot change. We tend to think about past issues and we get caught up in what's going on there instead of in the present. Uh, there's a lot of things in your life you can't change. And so I do not want you to be stricken or paralyzed with guilt today. Uh, I want us to think about where we are right now, and how we apply the word of God to our life today and in the future. And so don't be paralyzed in the past. Let's surrender to God's plan for today. I also want you to understand why, because you're probably feeling a sense of gravity in this moment. He's doing things a little different today. But but why bring up this issue? Why didn't we get to the sermon series? And I say, yeah, Jesus teaches on marriage and marriage is important and go to the next passage. I, I do believe that the church of the Lord Jesus Christ has to be clear on these issues. We, as the church, our, our mission is to declare the gospel of Jesus Christ. We are to witness the gospel of Jesus Christ. Marriage is a display of the gospel of Jesus Christ. And so marriage is our business because the gospel is our main business. And so we have to talk about these things in the church. So let's dig in. Verse 1. And he left there and he went to the region of Judea and beyond the Jordan. Remember, Jesus is with his disciples. He's teaching them. They're on a mission trip together. It's just them. They've been alone. Now he's moving toward Jerusalem and he begins to interact with crowds again. And I think one of the, my favorite things about the book of Mark, and uh, it's in the, all of the Gospels, but as I, as I studied Mark, one of my favorite things is this picture here of Jesus. As he's moving through the crowds, they gather around him, and it says, as was his custom, he taught them. Just the picture of Jesus teaching the crowds. That's what he does. He is the good shepherd who's feeding the sheep. Wherever he goes, he's leading them. It's such a beautiful picture, but always, as we know, the, the villains show up. Verse 2, 
And the Pharisees came up and in order to test him, asked him, is it lawful for a man to divorce his wife? And we don't know what Jesus was teaching on in that moment. Um, Probably didn't have anything to do with divorce and remarriage, but they butt in. And they want to stop him. They want to question him. Notice their motive is to test him, literally to confuse him, to trap him, to prove that he is an unfit rabbi. The, the Pharisees, they, they hedged the law with their rules and regulations, and they made their rules and regulations the law. And their goal was to trap everyone according to their laws. And they tried so hard to evaluate Jesus according to their laws, their understanding of Scripture. And in their custom, there were two debating schools concerning the issue of divorce. Two schools of rabbis that interpreted Deuteronomy 24 that said that a man could divorce his wife for indecency. And there were two schools of rabbis that interpreted indecency in two different ways. There was one school that you could divorce your wife for whatever reason you wanted to. You could come up with all kinds of reasons for indecency. She burned the toast. She was just not cleaning the house. And you could just do away with her. But you had to give her a certificate of divorce. And then there was another school that said, no, indecency means adultery and immorality. And the only way you can divorce your wife is for adultery and immorality. And so they want to put Jesus on the spot. What's your view? As a rabbi, what side are you going to take? And Jesus doesn't play their game. Verse 3, he answered them. He said, what did Moses command you? I, I don't care about these two schools of thought. I don't care about their interpretation. I don't care what you think. Let's talk about Moses. What did Moses command you? And they said, Moses allowed a man to write a certificate of divorce and send her away. Now, notice the difference in the word. What did Moses command? And then their response. They're not going to say Moses commanded anything concerning divorce. Notice the way they phrase it. Well, he allowed us. He allowed us. He allowed a man to write a certificate of divorce and send her away. They don't want to say anything about the command. And then verse five, and Jesus said, "Okay, let's talk about why he commanded this. Notice he says, because of the hardness of your heart, he wrote this commandment. Now, Jesus says the reason he allowed you to write the certificate of divorce was because of the hardness of your heart, because there were men who were abusing their wives and they were just going from one wife to next for whatever reason. And so Jesus says, Moses said, you can't do it that way. If you're going to divorce, he commanded that you write a certificate. That's where all of that came from. You you couldn't just put her away in silence and you couldn't just turn her out to fend for herself. People had to know what was going on. You had to make it public why you were divorcing her. And that's what Moses command it. If you concede to divorce, you must give a certificate. And Moses in Deuteronomy 24 would say it was only for immorality. Later, Jesus says that in Matthew 19, he says it's for immorality. He interprets this passage and he says, Moses commanded, if you are going to divorce, it must be for immorality and you must make it public through this certificate. And so to begin with, we we have to understand this. Divorce was never a commandment. It was a concession. And it was a public concession to sin against the covenant. You see, in our culture, we think about divorce and the terms that are always used are irreconcilable differences, meaning we just can't get along. And so there's really nobody at fault. It's just we got to go through this kind of business transaction to make things right with the kids and the house and all of that. That's not how divorce came into existence. It it came about because there was egregious sin against the covenant that had to be made public. Remember Mary and Joseph? 
the, the story of Jesus' birth, Joseph did not want to divorce her, did not want to put her away because he was a righteous man and he did not want to humiliate her. What was going on there is if Joseph put her away, everyone would immediately know Mary was guilty of adultery. And they knew he was righteous. And Joseph did not want to make that public. But that's where divorce comes from. It was a public concession to sin. And there was an egregious act on the covenant of marriage that led to divorce. Now, I don't think in this section, as we move through this passage, that Jesus wants to be exhaustive about all the reasons for divorce, about all of the concessions or exceptions or reasons you can get divorced. But just so we know, there are three specific concessions to divorce in the Bible. And the first is adultery. In Matthew 19, when Matthew describes this interaction, he includes adultery as an exception or concession for divorce. The word is actually unrepentant sexual sin is cause for divorce. In 1 Corinthians chapter 7, verse 15, abandonment of an unbelieving spouse is cause for divorce. Paul writes this, but if the unbelieving partner separates, let it be so. In such cases, the brother or sister is not enslaved. And so if you're married to an unbeliever, They don't believe the gospel and they are intent on leaving and abandoning the marriage. There's nothing you can do in that moment. Now, the goal is to stay married. But if you get to the point with an unbeliever that there is a concession there. And I think closely related to abandonment is abuse. If there is abuse because of unbelief in marriage, that is a concession to divorce. And we'll talk about that later. But they were all to protect one party. One party in the marriage was egregiously sinned against. And that sin had to be made public. That's what divorce was. You couldn't keep it in secret. People had to know why these people aren't married anymore. Something has happened. Brokenness happened here. And and we would admit this today that God can lead from divorce to a lot of good things. Some of us here today, we look back on that time in our life and it was horrible and it was really bad. You made mistakes. Other people made mistakes. You sinned. There was sin involved. And you look at your life now and you say, well, I wouldn't enjoy what I have now if that had never happened. And that is true. But the act itself was a concession to sin. There was brokenness involved. It wasn't a commandment to goodness. It was a concession to To brokenness. And we have to see it that way. So what was broken? Notice as the text continues. Jesus says, this is this is what this is about. This is why it's such a big deal. They come to him and they they say, Jesus, what about divorce? And he turns around with them and says, "Okay, what about marriage? Jesus wants to make marriage the issue here. Notice verse six. He says, but from the beginning of creation, God made male and female. And so they come to him, what did Moses teach about this? He says, okay, what did the law say? But then he says, I know what Moses taught about this. Let's go back to Genesis chapter 1. And Moses wrote the words, in the beginning, God created male and female. Let's go back before the law. Let's go back even before sin. Let's go back before brokenness. Let's go back before the concession of divorce. God created male and female. God created two genders in His image. They were equal in His image, but they were not the same. And they are not the same because they are designed to come together as one. Notice the text continues, therefore, man shall leave his father and mother and hold fast to his wife. And so through male and female families are created from male and female father and mother. New families are created as men and women leave and they create families of their own. And notice the phrase, he shall hold fast to his wife. That word is so important, means he shall be intertwined with his wife. It means he shall be immersed into his wife. It is the same word. uh, that we think of when we think about baptism. 
You're to leave your father and mother and be immersed with your wife. And notice, notice the text says, and the two shall become one flesh. They shall be welded together. They shall become one. And notice, so they are no longer two, but one flesh. And this is the way the covenant of marriage is described. As one flesh. No longer two, but one. Intertwined, immersed, welded together in every way. Emotionally, spiritually, and physically. The two become one. And I know we're all thinking, yes, the, the sexual union between man and woman displays the covenant. It is the sign of marriage. And it displays what's going on in marriage. And notice verse 9. What therefore God has joined together, let not man separate. These words, hold fast, become one, join together, it is describing literally a welding, a putting together that is inseparable. But notice verse 9, by God himself. Notice who puts the two as one together. God. This happens before God. And Jesus says, let not man separate. God is the one who put them together in the marriage covenant. When a man and a woman take part in this covenant, they are cemented body, heart, soul together. If you want to know who your soulmate is, look at your marriage certificate. And then remember, God did that. God did that. And so you have no business separating it. You have no business tearing it apart, ripping it apart. The language describes that you can't do that. It would be impossible to take apart something God has put together. And so to summarize, the marriage covenant between one man and one woman before God is where the two become one in every every way possible. And they are inseparable before God and the world. That's what marriage is. It's a covenant. Why? Why did God create marriage, which is so important to know and think about in this moment as we we feel the weight of what marriage is and we think about that covenant and how the gravity that comes with it. Why did God put that into the world? Well, Paul says this mystery that I speak to you of concerning marriage. It's about Christ in the church. Marriage was created to display Jesus's love for the church. That's why the two become one and are inseparable, because Jesus's love for the church cannot be separated. It's unending. Jesus chooses to be one with his church. Jesus chooses that he will never be separated from his church. It's not as though God were. We're standing around, I guess, sitting around. The Holy Spirit floating around, however, whatever goes on there. And said, man, I really need to encourage marriages how can I encourage marriages? I know I will I, I will tell people about Jesus's love for the church and marriages will be better. Now, that does happen, but that's not the order in which it happened. Jesus loved his church in eternity past. Jesus loved his church before time and space ever existed. His love for the church is eternal. And so when the world is created, God says, how can I display my love for my people? How can I display the gospel? And he creates this beautiful relationship called marriage. He says, male and female will covenant together and it will be a walking, breathing flesh and blood display of the gospel. And so if you're married here today, that's your mission. To display the gospel in your marriage. You are a walking, breathing, in flesh picture before the world of Jesus' love for the church. And every marriage reflects the gospel. In some marriages, it's very, very clear. You see it on display. You get it. There it is. 
That's how Jesus loves the church. That's how the church submits to Jesus. I see it. In other marriages, it's flickers. Man, I see it sometimes. And then some, it's marred. But every marriage is saying something about the gospel, something true or something false. There's no in between. And so what about divorce, Jesus? He says, no, what about marriage? In marriage, you have vowed to be a walking, breathing display of the gospel. And that means this is a holy covenant. And I think we've got to get marriage right before we start talking about any of these other things. Marriage is a holy covenant. It means two people are set apart before God. That's what the word holy means. You are set apart from the rest of the world to be one with one another. And it is a covenant where a third party writes the vows. And that third party is God Himself. Couples come to me and they have their vows for their wedding. And I say, you guys can stand up here and you can say that to one another. And I'll step back over here and we'll watch and we'll ooh and ah and everybody will cry. And you say that. But at some point, I have to stand between you and tell you what God has said. And you commit to what God's telling you to do in marriage, not what you want to do or what you think you're going to do, but what God has said. You commit to those vows together. And it is before witnesses. The church who has been given the gospel is not passive spectators at a wedding ceremony. We are witnesses. When people in our church get married, we stand there as witnesses. And they say, I do. And we stand up and say, yes, you will. Because our witness as a church is at stake in your marriage. And we're going to stand here with you. And we're going to help you. And we're going to love you. And we're going to pray with you. We're going to hold your hand. And we're going to walk through the most difficult times in marriage with you. But we're not spectators to something that's happening apart from us. If you attend a wedding, you have a responsibility that they, your friends, your family, fulfill their vows. And the certificate that you get from the state, it's not just a piece of paper. You are saying, according to the laws of the land, I bind myself to you. And it used to cost you something to unbind those laws. That legal declaration. But in every way, by God, before God, before God's people and before the world, you become one. Weddings are to be holy ceremonies. And the covenant is at the centerpiece of it all. Listen, I get it. Revelation is a big party. The marriage supper of the Lamb. There is dancing and there is singing and there is eating and there is drinking and there is a hoopla in the New Jerusalem, the banquet hall. Yeah, I said there would be dancing in the the fellowship hall of the New Jerusalem. That's going to happen. And that should happen at your weddings. Yes, it should. It's a celebration. But it's, it's not just a spectacle for people to watch. And you need to understand, as you were married, you vowed before God some things that God said you were going to do. Husbands, you said you were going to love your wife as Christ loved the church before God and before others. And that's your first and foremost, your responsibility in the world to love her like a savior who died on the cross for her. Even if it takes you your life, you will love her. You vowed to do that before God. You can just enter a business transaction. Covenants in the Old Testament, it would strike me dead if I don't fulfill them. Wives, you vowed to respect and submit to your husband as unto the Lord. You vowed that you would seek to find security in your husband as a leader, protector, provider. You vowed to do that before the Lord. At our weddings, our unbelieving friends should be so uncomfortable. You don't plan your wedding for your unbelieving friends, by the way. I'll ne- I, I, there have been moments where I and I am like the oddball, awkward guy in the room at every wedding I do now. And they're thinking, whoa, that's wow. My goodness, you tied that night t- tight. I don't know if I said that right. You tied the knot tight. That's what they say. The old folks that are usually there. 
But the, the, the little bridesmaids who are up there because they want to be pretty, and they, they don't know Jesus. And I'm up there talking about submission, respect, trust, meekness. I'll never forget one of the weddings. Some of y'all were at it. And one of the bridesmaids just in the middle of it all said, Oh, come on already. And I, I just kept preaching. I, that just made me, I got fired up. She needed to hear the gospel. But there's going to be family and friends uncomfortable because of the vow that's taking part. in. God is declaring something cosmic and galactic in their presence about his love for the church. Church folks should feel the weight of the witness that we, we take part in. We're not just having a wedding. We're making a covenant. So, verse 10. And in the house, the disciples asked him about this matter. Okay, you... You kind of diverted. You didn't really answer. What do you really believe about these things, Jesus? And he said to them, whoever divorces his wife and marries another commits adultery against her. And if she divorces her husband and marries another, she commits adultery. And so they want Jesus to be clear. And he says, OK, I'll be clear. And he says here, if you concede to divorce and marry another, you commit adultery for the man and for the woman. And and the elephant in the room right now is, so is all remarriage adultery? Well, I don't believe Jesus' point in that statement is to be exhaustive about every concession to divorce or every exception to remarriage. In Matthew, when he answers it, he adds adultery. I still believe Jesus is focused on the two schools of thought. And he takes a side here. And he says... If you remarry, apart from adultery, you commit adultery yourself. If a, he's, he's addressing the issue of Deuteronomy 24, where men were abandoning their wives for every reason. And he's saying, you can't do that. You can't leave your wife for whatever reason and just go marry someone else. He says, that is adultery. I believe that's what Jesus is teaching here. And I don't think the point is to really address remarriage but to intensify what he means about the covenant. Because notice something here. Notice he says you, he sins, he commits adultery against her. Notice that. And then if she divorces her husband and marries another, she commits adultery. But, but the emphasis here is what the man is doing when he uh, divorces and remarries. He commits adultery against her. Why is that important? Because divorce and adultery were never described in those terms as sin against the woman. As adultery against her. And he's saying a man can't just do whatever he wants to. And, and he can't go out and just find another wife whenever he wants to. That is adultery. Why? Well, going back to what he just taught us about marriage, they have become one flesh and the woman he has become one flesh with has all the responsibilities and rights and privilege to the covenant as the man does. He's emphasizing again the covenant of marriage. They both have rights and privileges to the covenant and the man can't just do whatever he wants to. You really are one flesh with equal rights. And in Matthew, when Jesus says this, his look at him and say, hold on. He sins against her. It is better not get married. And Jesus says, you're right. Because they get the seriousness of the covenant. The man and the woman both have rights to it. They have become one flesh. As Jesus emphasizes marriage, they get it. They are one. This isn't it's not the, the man in some transaction that he has made to have kids, and to have his house cleaned and, and to do whatever. No, they are one. And if he if he breaks that covenant and goes and finds someone else, he's committed adultery against her. Jesus is protecting the woman here. He's also emphasizing they are one. 
And one of the things, if we go back and we look at the context of Mark, Jesus is getting at something here. And he is saying everything that that, that comes along in the life of a follower of Christ has a higher standard. Remember, this all began, take up your cross and follow me. If you want to come after me, you're going to have to deny yourself and be ready to die. Just a few weeks ago, he said, if your eye causes you to sin, poke it out. If your hand causes you to sin, cut it off. Your feet cause you to sin. What's he trying to communicate? When you follow after me, these things take greater weight. And marriage for a disciple of Christ takes greater weight. If you are a follower of Christ, there is an intense level of gospel witness that comes along with marriage. And Jesus is emphasizing that. They come to him and say, what about divorce, Jesus? He said, no, what about marriage? Let me teach you what I think about marriage and what's at stake in marriage. And so in light of the design of marriage, in light of the covenant that we've talked about, and in light of discipleship, what about divorce? What about divorce? Well, in light of what Jesus has said here, I believe divorce should be a last resort in every situation. I believe you have to take this very seriously. And even when we start talking about exceptions, adultery, abandonment, we start talking about those things. You have to you have to possess those things with great weight. And it should be the last resort in light of everything we've talked about, God's design for marriage in light of the gospel and God's high call for a disciple. And then when you start thinking about remarriage, you should proceed with very much caution. And so how do we process this? How do we apply it? Well, I don't think we ask the question. We never ask the question, can I get a divorce? Don't ask that question. You may ask, should I? Don't ask, can I? Should I? And rarely is the answer yes. And I want to give a disclaimer here and i want to be as clear as i possibly can here in saying this as the pastor of this church abuse of a woman a woman who is trapped in a situation of cruelty and abuse which i believe jesus is actually dealing with here he's pressing on the man the responsibility for protection there are times you you should separate most of the time you should separate I will encourage you all the time if you come to me and there's abuse and there's cruelty, you need to at least separate. And there will be times where when you ask the question, should I, for your safety and your kids' safety, I will say absolutely yes. I just want to go on record saying that. Because I know when I, I teach on this, there's a lot of women who feel helpless and you're not helpless. You are not. So don't feel that today. If you feel anything... No, I got your back. It's, but you, there's a lot of times where it's not your choice. And it is the last resort. And so maybe you're here today and concerning adultery, abandonment, and you say, I've experienced these things. Can I? I would still say, should you? Should you? Is it the right thing for you to do in light of God's design for marriage? Christ in the church. Because of our sin, Jesus has every right to divorce us. In the book of Hosea, God calls a man to marry a prostitute. And he says, you're going to display my love for my people because they're prostitutes against me. So you've got to take all that into consideration. I know there are hundreds of situations that you're going through your mind right now. And you're trying to figure them out and sort them out. And I can't do that today. I would love to sit down and walk with you through those situations. I, I can't. But I know we've got to come back to this. Jesus loves his church. He's not walking away from us. He's not going to abandon us. And so then you ask the question, okay, should I get remarried? I, I, even then, I don't think you should say, can I? I think you should think, should I? Is this the right thing to do? 
Some of you are here today and your, your spouse has died and you meet a Christian, a Christian. Christian. Who you can display the gospel with. Yes. Do it. But what if you fall in these situations where your divorce was for one of these exceptions? You're asking, should I remarry? It was adultery. There was sexual sin involved. You were abandoned by an unbeliever. Maybe you were abused. I would say remarriage outside of those contexts is sin. Those are the only exceptions Jesus gives. And that's where I have to stay. And that is the counsel that I would give you. And clearly, if you were the one who was unfaithful and abandoned and abused, I think Jesus would say you're committing adultery here. And even when I say that, there's a lot of situations. Again, we would love to walk with you through those things. This isn't pushing you away. This is let's let's sort those things out and let's talk about them. But before remarriage, I still think you have to ask the question, should I? Is reconciliation with your spouse possible? Is your spouse repentant and desiring reconciliation? Is your spouse remarried? Have you asked all of those questions? Have you repented of any sin in your heart? And are you doing everything you could possibly do to reconcile with your spouse? Have you done it all before God? You still have to ask those questions. And then should I? Should I? I do feel the weight in the room. And I just want you to know we're going to do this together. These situations that we're thinking about, there's even singles here today are trying to figure all this out. Premarital count. We want to do this together because of the gospel. So I hope you're not don't feel like you're being pushed away in any way. Especially if you're here today and you say, I've been divorced. Am I in sin? Let me say this to you. Look at me. Your divorce may have been sin, but that doesn't mean you're in sin. Especially if you have repented of sin that you caused. Especially if you've turned from bitterness and resentment toward your spouse. And maybe that's something you need to do is just turn from things that you've held on for many years And let go of those things and repent before your kids and your family and friends and church. Maybe that's something you need to do. God doesn't want you to live in the guilt-stricken fear of thinking you're in sin because of your past. The gospel is true today. Maybe you're here and you say, I've been divorced and remarried. Am I in sin? I'll say it this way. Your remarriage may have been sin, but that doesn't mean you're in sin. The act may have been sin. Have you repented of any personal sin in your divorce and even remarriage? Any sin that you caused? Have you confessed that? Have you repented of that? Have you repented of even sinfully pursuing remarriage? And this is one way folks who are divorced and remarried sin. Right now. Are you living in the joy of the gospel? One way you could be sinning right now is you're trying to live in your marriage right now to make up for your past. That's sin because you don't believe the gospel. God wants you to enjoy the gospel. God wants you to turn from past sin and display the gospel in your marriage now. He wants you to use the marriage you have now to display the gospel. Don't steal that from the glory of God. There there are close friends of mine who've gone through all of this, and they are some of my closest friends and heroes in this church. They live out the gospel. Live out forgiveness. They would tell you, no, that was hard and that was difficult and that was wrong. Don't do it. And they are pictures of grace in this church. And I want to tell you, I, I, as your pastor, thank you. Thank you for displaying the gospel. In Malachi, it is true that God says he hates divorce. It is a violent act where you're ripping something apart that he put together. But just because. God hates divorce. If you have repented of your sin and turned from your sin, that doesn't mean God hates you. God can hate divorce and still love you. 
And I believe that's the truth of the gospel. And it is actually the truth for everyone here. Even as we move from these issues, the reality is before God, we are all covenant breakers. God created us in his image to display his glory. That is the covenant he made with us from creation that we would live to his glory. And guess what? Every person here today broke that covenant. You said, I'm going to live however I want to, and I'm going to be the king that I want to be, and I'm going to do things my way. And our only hope is not in that we would keep any covenant. Our hope to get to heaven is not that we would keep any vow. Our hope is that there is one covenant keeper and his name is Jesus Christ. And Jesus the Christ keeps all of his vows. And he vows today that if you would turn from your sin and you would believe in him, that he died on the cross for your sin and that he lived a perfect righteous life for you. And he has been raised from the dead and he offers you an eternal kingdom. And if you would believe in him, he vows, he vows with his own blood, his life, Shed on the cross for your sin. Blood of the covenant is for you and he will not break it. And so the very covenant that we have such a hard time, even in my own life, of reflecting. The very covenant that we break at times is actually a picture of the covenant that's our only hope. The covenant Jesus keeps for us. 